There are three major defense strategies. Avoidance, simply stay out of the way. Resistance, fight against it. And tolerance, deal with it. Avoidance behaviors reduce pathogen exposure. They include innate and acquired aversions to markers of high microbial density, such as smell or taste. Nausea and feelings of disgust, which help to prevent infections and exposure to toxic compounds. Avoidance is a normal defensive response, but people vary significantly in its expression. The extreme response is germophobia, which is a common form of obsessive compulsive disorder. So here are some Roman latrines, and here is a yellow fever quarantine. Quarantine is a way of simply making sure that people are not exposed. Resistance mechanisms are mechanisms that aim to eliminate the infection once it's been established. They reduce the pathogen burden by detecting, destroying, and eliminating the pathogen. That's the main function of the immune system. Depending on the resistance strategy, immune responses can themselves cause different kinds of immunopathology, autoimmune diseases, allergies, asthma, colitis, and so forth. So resistance can be very costly. There may come a point at which tolerating an infection is less costly than resisting it. So consider a host and a pathogen. There can be direct damage caused by the pathogen. There can be resistance to the pathogen, but then there can also be damage that's caused by the immune response. The host can then also try to block the direct damage by the pathogen and the host can try to decrease the damage caused by the immune response. So there is quite a list of costs and benefits involved in resistance. Tolerance is another way of dealing with environmental insult. Tolerance mechanisms reduce the negative effects on host fitness of a given level of pathogen burden. They probably won't eliminate them, but they will reduce the impact. They protect and repair tissue through inducible maintenance. And because tolerance mechanisms do not affect pathogens directly, they impose less selection on pathogens than do resistance mechanisms. So if the host is tolerating a pathogen, that is a different outcome probably in host pathogen coevolution than if the host is resisting the pathogen. Consequently, there is less of an arms race and there is little variation among individuals for tolerance genes, in sharp contrast to resistance genes, which are highly polymorphic, indicating a long history of coevolutionary interaction. Tolerance mechanisms help to sustain homeostatic relationships with commensal microorganisms and the highly colonized sites, such as the colon. So, Tolerance plays a big role in the way the immune system manages the microbiota. Like resistance, tolerance can also be costly. For example, tissue protection can interfere with tissue function. One way to conceptualize resistance and tolerance is to think of reaction norms. So in the left-hand panel here, we have on the x-axis, pathogen burden increasing to the right. We have host fitness here on the left. The more resistant genotype has lower pathogen burden and is more fit. The less resistant genotype has higher pathogen burden and is less fit. If we then look at the tolerance concept with the same axes, pathogen burden and host fitness, the blue line here is the less tolerant genotype. So as pathogen burden increases, it loses fitness fairly rapidly. The more tolerant genotype is one where as pathogen burden increases, fitness is lost more slowly. What about defense priorities? All defenses aim to insulate vital organs first, that would be brain and heart, and processes the cardiovascular and respiratory processes from environmental challenges. This is often done by changing resource allocation in the body. 
So during prolonged fasting, the brain continues to utilize glucose at the expense of the other tissues. For glucose uptake in the brain is not insulin dependent, and that's unlike other major glucose consuming tissues, primarily skeletal muscle and fat. Similarly, during hypoxia, the more oxygenated blood is disproportionately distributed to the brain. And during hypothermia, the same is true for the warmer blood. There are certain vital tissues and organs that are known as immunoprivileged sites that are protected from important kinds of immunopathology. They include the brain, the gonads, and the eyes. Immune responses that have the potential to destroy tissue are not permitted in these tissues, which pay less for the cost of immune response. So there is a spectrum of tissue vulnerability to immunopathology from dispensable renewable tissues to immunoprivileged tissues, and there is a spectrum of tissue responsiveness to inflammatory mediators. So immunoprivileged tissues do not respond to inflammatory mediators, and dispensable and renewal tissues are actually ones in which you can have significant immunopathology. So if we look here at different physiological axes, what we see is that tissue vulnerability to damage is affecting tolerance capacity and priority in cost allocation for defense and repair. So the intrinsic susceptibility of damage to damage is higher in brain and heart and lower in liver and skin, which can repair more easily. The ability to renew and repair is low in neurons and cardiomycetes and higher in liver cells and intestinal epithelium. The autonomy, the functional autonomy of neurons and sensory epithelia is relatively low. The functional autonomy of hepatocytes and red blood cells is relatively high. And the consequences of damage, the damaged sequelae, are severe in brain and in vascular and respiratory systems and are moderate in liver and skin. So these tissues have low tolerance and these tissues have high tolerance. To summarize, defense priorities say that if possible, avoid the threat using vision, taste, and smell. If infected, then one has to make a choice to resist or to tolerate. Make that decision depending on the costs and benefits of resistance and tolerance. These benefits and costs vary among tissues and organs. The critical organs are immune privileged to avoid the costs of inflammation.